Hello again. Conundrums. Why are they important? And why are we philosophizers in particular so interested in them? In this chapter, which is chapter 16 of my book, Philosophizer's Bible, I'm going to be looking at conundrums both in metaphysics and also in ethics. And according to my definition, a conundrum is a problem that cannot be solved, a question that cannot be answered. Now, of course, that very statement involves a problem, because how do I know? How do I know the problem doesn't have a solution or the question doesn't have an answer? And the only thing one can say is, we don't know. As a good Peronian skeptic, I'm not going to state absolutely and categorically that any given question or problem is a conundrum. But what I can say is that the onus is on those who think they are soluble to provide a solution. And what philosophers actually do, and this is, this is where it connects with the discussion of religion in the previous chapter, they believe, as a matter of faith, that their methods, their philosophical methods, the methods of analysis and logic, those methods can solve any problem. And if the problem can't be solved, or if the question can't be answered, it wasn't a real problem in the first place. It wasn't a real question. It was only a pseudo-problem. And this is the source of Wittgenstein's famous or the background to Wittgenstein's famous uh, comment, my task is to show the fly the way out of the fly bottle. In Wittgenstein's view, when we are involved, entangled with a philosophical problem, what has happened is we've lost our way. We're confused. We've been deceived. There really isn't a problem in reality. It's just a problem with us. And once you've shown the fly out the way out of the fly bottle, the problem's gone. And that attitude, even though philosophers don't always agree with Wittgenstein by any means, that attitude that all the problems are sol soluble and we our methods are going to solve them, is the thing that I'm basically rejecting completely. It's a complete um, fabrication. It's something philosophers have done to justify their existence. Oh, we know so much, we can prove so much, you know, give us any problem and we'll solve it or we'll show you that it isn't a problem at all. I'm afraid that's something that leaves me cold. There are real problems, there are real questions, there are conundrums. And that is something that fills me with wonder. As a philosophizer, it fills me with wonder. But these questions don't have answers. Or possibly don't. Because I can never know for sure. And that's um, a view of reality which is exceedingly modest. Um, it's a proper view to take when you really, really don't know. And these philosophers are claiming knowledge which they don't possess. That's the long and short of it. Conundrums. Credo quia absurdum est. That's a, um, a Latin phrase, I believe, because it's absurd, which is associated with certain um, certain thinkers in the Christian religion. Could have been Aquinas. The most impossible things are true, and logic proves it. Statements about the past that we are unable to verify or falsify do not have any truth value. Michael Dummett. There is no such thing as personal identity. 
Derek Parfit. Every vague statement has precise truth conditions of which we human beings remain ignorant. Timothy Williamson. Those are three well-known British philosophers who've been highly lauded for their contributions, for their great contributions to the subject. I admit I once believed, not necessarily in these particular conclusions, which for anyone with an ounce of common sense are simply absurd, but generally in the possibility that our beliefs can be revised, reformed by the application of logical analysis. Well, I'm all for that, you know, be logical, sure. You know, sometimes you can be wrong because you are being illogical and you can discover that you were illogical. So what? Then I blinked and woke up. Philosophy has become religious. Analytic philosophy is a religion. All that is lacking are the robes and headgear. Who are these people, you ask? All you need to know is that they are, or were, the philosopher priests of the day, whose names will be forgotten in 50 years from now, rock stars even in their dotage, fawned upon and mobbed by admiring crowds of true believers, and mocked wherever they were turned up to speak at a seminar or lecture hall. You're nothing but a Punch and Judy show. I can prove X. Well, I can prove Y. No X, no Y. And so it goes on. Here's a different take. Not every problem in philosophy is soluble. Not every philosophical question has an answer that we can discover through inquiry however patiently or doggedly pursued. I already gave one example. Is the past real or is it unreal? Is the past just a gigantic hole that burns up every living event into dust? Or are events immutable, unchanged by the passage of time? It's a serious question, a question on which turns our attitude to life itself. Dummett uses his quote-unquote anti-realist theory of meaning to prove that the past is unreal, then later, surprise, surprise, appears on a religious TV show expressing his hope that the argument he gave can be used as a roundabout way of proving the existence of God. Well, when I saw that show on TV, I just fell off my chair. I couldn't believe it. If God doesn't exist, then the past is unreal. But if the thought that the past is unreal is unthinkable, then God must exist. QED. Laughable, but also sad. Not everything is knowable. Not everything can be understood. Philosophy has limits. When you reach the limit, or what you take to be the limit, you could always be wrong. The proper attitude is modesty. I just don't know. I don't know where to take things from here. And from modesty comes wonder. There's something I don't know. There's a wall that I or we can never surmount. A metaphysical wall, a cosmic stop sign. Let's define a conundrum as something which presents itself as a philosophical problem, which is in fact incapable of solution. I don't accept Wittgenstein's view that the conundrums of philosophy can be overcome by showing the fly the way out of the fly bottle. We may be fooled into thinking that a problem has no solution when in fact it is soluble, but the existence of what appears to be a conundrum is not necessarily the result of mere confusion or sophistical argument or trickery. As you would expect, some apparent conundrums are in fact soluble. There is no problem of vagueness, as Timothy Williamson thinks, because words have no meaning. Remember that chapter? Language works despite its inherent vagueness. You use as many words as you need, coin whatever terms you like, sufficient to get your point across. True conundrums are not created by us. They are not the result of confusion over logic or language or anything of that sort. They are discovered. They are facts. 
The most persuasive examples of conundrums can be found in ethics. A genuine ethical dilemma is a conundrum because whatever you do, you will be in the wrong. There is no ideal solution. All you can do is decide on your best course of action and accept the consequences, whatever they may be. You're damned if you do, damned if you don't. By acceptance, I mean something like stoical acceptance. There are real situations where you are ethically damned regardless of what you do and regardless of your prior innocence, quote unquote. It's just your bad luck to be there at this particular place and time. Your bad luck that all this shit falls into your lap. There is no way to prove that a philosophical problem is a conundrum. You can't prove that an answer which you'd never thought of might not be found at some time in the future, or the far future. There is no way to survey all the potential solutions and determine in each case whether or not the proposed solution is adequate or inadequate. However, by the same token, neither is it possible to prove that there are no philosophical conundrums. An error theory, like Wittgenstein's notion that we misunderstand the logic of our own language, is just a theory, nothing more. You might rep say in reply that my notion of conundrums is just my theory. I can't prove that conundrums exist in reality. The best I can offer is a theory in the spirit of the best explanation. Here is a slew of problems that philosophers have argued over incessantly. Isn't it plausible that at least some of these problems are insoluble? Some might think my theory is plausible, while others might think my theory is not the least bit plausible. It is simply unacceptable that we should be forced to accept that there are limits to what can be proved, what is proved. Can you see this is all a, an argument over onus? But the point is, the onus is on those who think these are soluble, not the other way around. And as a matter of religious faith, they believe they are soluble, they must be soluble. Well, I'm not arguing with you. Believe what you like or disbelief. It's no concern of mine. We philosophers see, that's all I need to say. Agree with me or don't agree with me. That's a question which is easy to decide. As a test case, not to prove or disprove anything, but just to show, I'm going to consider a question that we have not examined up to now. Free will. Free will is a question on which philosophers take positions. If you look at any standard introduction to philosophy, you will learn what these are. Philosophers pose a dilemma, attributed to the philosopher David Hume, although it is questionable whether he meant his words to be taken in this way. The dilemma is this. You can't act freely if the universe is deterministic, because you're just one of the moving parts in a mechanical clock. You can't act freely if the universe is not deterministic, because then, insofar as your decision isn't determined, you're just like a roulette wheel. I've stated Hume's dilemma in the crudest, Hume's dilemma in the crudest terms, but after adding all the fancy qualifications and logical finesses, the result is the same. There is simply no room for free action, as we naively suppose this to be. Wrong. All this rigmarole shows is that we don't understand, we really don't understand, the nature of human action. The very idea that one can act, that action takes place at all, that there is any room for action in the universe as science conceives it, or even as religious faith conceives it, is a mystery. Action is something to wonder at. You see, this is the thing. It's, it's something that's right in front of you. It's something that we live through every day. It's the most real thing, but we don't question it. And because we don't question it, we then find ourselves entangled in, in this, this dilemma about what it is. We don't see it as something to wonder at. Here's a possible view. I don't claim any more than that. Determinism is false and indeterminism is also false.
Things don't happen because other things happen, not ever. And they don't happen randomly either. Everything, every single event that occurs in the universe, is an action. It is the result of a decision, in some sense that we can either understand, in our own limited case, or we do not understand. And where you don't understand, all you can do is wonder. Well, a, as I said, I put this forward as a theory. I've no possible way of determining whether this theory is true or false. But basically what I'm saying is that the problem of free will arises because we assume that we know what causality is. We assume that the universe, by and large, works by means of cause and effect. And there's no reason for that assumption to be true. It's not the only possibility. And if you just consider the possibility that action is more basic than cause and effect, if you consider the possibility that action is the deepest concept and causality is just a description of experience, then you have a very, very different take on the problem of free will. And of all the philosophers, I think Schopenhauer came closest to realizing the importance of action. Um, there's another, that was you know, in, the, in the 19th century, but there's another philosopher called John McMurray, who was writing in the earlier part of the 20th century, um, up, to, up into the 1950s. And um, he describes, he, he develops this idea that the world is one action. I'm not saying that he's right. Um, he had a kind of religious interest in promoting this. Um, but it's just that there's a way, a possible way of seeing, a different way of seeing. A way that opens up possibilities we hadn't considered before. And in a way, that's all I'm trying to do in this book. Even when I sound dogmatic, I'm being dogmatic in rejecting dogmatism, rejecting the philosophers who believe with fervently religious belief in, their, in the effectiveness of their logical methods, the methods of logical analysis. Um, I think that's all I've got to say for today, so I'll leave it there. Thanks for watching.